was actually a presentation he gave at the IEEE meeting uh, back in April, May, June, in June. It was part of a tutorial, so this was designed to be a tutorial right from the word go. One of the things you should know is that within his presentation, which is very, very broad, what you will find is that it actually overlaps with some people who are going to be talking later in, in, the, in the course. So, okay, you will be able to hone your questions in on Andrew, so when the speakers turn up in two or three days or in a few weeks, your questions will be really, really sharp, because they won't know that he's introduced their topic. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll think that they're telling you something for new. So you can, you can ask them right in the middle of their introduction some really, really poignant question. <laughs> Put them on the spot. So apart from that, I will tell you that Andrew apologises for not shaving this morning. Uh, <laughs> You'll also discover that he's got a funny accent. <laughs> Thanks, Gar. Um, it's all loud enough or too loud? It's all right. Um, Gary mentioned apologies for my funny accent. Hopefully, you can uh, understand what I'm saying and follow the talk. Um, also, uh, apologies to the people who are speaking after me. I'd like you all to say if you have pointed questions for those people. Not for me, keep all the questions for me nice and simple. Um, when Sean asked me to give this presentation, I decided um, on the title Next Generation Strategies to Maximize Photon Harvesting in Organic PV Devices. Pretty much as soon as I gave that title to Sean, I realized that most of these strategies are actually applicable to quite a wide range of single junction devices. Um, mainly if they have a fairly wide bank of absorbing um, light harvesting material. So, to, um, as Gary mentioned, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to a number of novel strategies for converting as much of the solar spectrum as possible. And these are typically four to six slides on each topic, just giving you a little flavor of what goes on. And hopefully throughout the rest of the course, you'll get um, a lot more information about a lot of these factors. And so the motivation for these um, different strategies for harvesting as much of the solar spectrum as possible comes from the fact that in a single junction device there are a number of loss mechanisms. Um, you can have thermalization where any energy above the bank up of the material is lost predominantly due to heat. Um, transmission losses where any photons below the bank gap of the material actually pass straight through the device. Recombination losses where photoexcited carriers are not harvested and simply recombined to the ground state. And then a couple of other losses, one junction loss and then also contact voltage loss. I'm actually not going to talk about the, the last two, I'm going to touch on the first three. Um, I also show on the, the bottom right hand corner um, the shock requires element for a single junction solar cell and show the maximum power conversion efficiency that can theoretically be obtained for a given bang up. Um, I also plot um, three kind of typical examples of different PV technologies. The first one is a polymer fullerene bulkhead junction. Um, although it should be noted that the precise position of this bank gap depends on what you consider the band edge of the material to be, what you consider the lowest energy transition. Um, the other two devices are a disensitized solar cell and then amorphous solar print. And what you can see is these devices all fall well short of their theoretical <coughs> maximum. Um, some of the um, some of the strategies I'm going to discuss with you today are about pushing these devices up towards that maximum and potentially even over and above that. So, um, the, the breakdown of what I'll cover today, um, in terms of recombination losses, I'll talk about long range energy transfer in organic systems, and device engineering for nanocrystal solar cells, and these are both aimed at um, minimizing the amount of recombination, so actually harvesting as many uh, electron hole pairs from the photo excitation as possible. Um, I'll then also discuss thermalization losses um, 
and talk about changing the band gap of the light harvesting material, um, down conversion and singlet fission. Um, you make a note that singlet fission is a, a, a molecular analog of multiple exciton generation in some conductor nanocrystals. I won't actually talk about that today, although I will touch a little bit on uh, nanocrystal solar cells. And then finally, in terms of transmission losses, I'll talk about um, upconversion and then um, strategies to enhance absorption within the active layer, and I won't actually cover downshift them. Um, for the vast majority of PV devices, I don't really consider that a, a viable way to boost the efficiency. A lot of the materials actually work perfectly well in those short wavelengths. There's no real need to think about downshift as a strategy to enhance the performance. Um, so for each section, I'm going to give a, a summary slide like this, and I'll point you towards uh, corresponding talks in the remainder of the summer school, where you can pick up a lot more information than the three or four slides I'm going to show you. So in terms of minimizing carrier recombination, the first example is the nanocrystal Schottky cell. Um, and Joey Ruffell will be giving a talk um, on semiconductor quantum dot solar cells. And so um, I encourage you to go along to his talk if you're interested in, in these types of PV devices. So the first example of these solar cells was actually generated by Joey Luther and his colleagues at Enrol um, using lead, selenide, quantum dot film sandwiched between two contacts. Um, what, what happens in these devices is you set up a shock barrier that can actually um, provide a built-in field to dissociate the charge carriers. And so what happens is the electrons flow downhill to the metal and the holes uphill to the ITO. What, what you can see is the devices actually perform reasonably well, about 2.4%. Um, get a very high current and a small open circuit voltage. And the AQA of the solar cell, so the number of carriers extracted for photons in, actually matches the nanocrystal absorption given in yellow. And here you can see two different device thicknesses, and, and you see that um, the biggest difference between these is that you enhance the absorption in the low energy part of the spectrum, um, mainly due to the, um, the first exotonic transition in the nanocrystal. And that's simply because the, the absorption coefficient in this system is, is fairly weak at those wavelengths, and so you need a thicker film to be able to harvest those photons. One of the things that um, these guys noticed was that if you measured uh, the internal quantum efficiency, so in this case, this is the number of charge carriers extracted for the amount of photons absorbed in the device, that as you increase the thickness, you see a big drop off in the blue region of the spectrum. The reason for that is blue photons are absorbed predominantly at this interface. And that means they're absorbed a long way from the shock barrier, and therefore they just simply aren't separated and you get a large combination loss. So that kind of implies that the shock dial is actually in the, um, at the wrong side of the device in this case, and they would like to move it to the front side of the device to harvest as many um, carrier pairs as they can. That led them to insert a zinc oxide nanocrystal layer that shifted the shock barrier to the front of the device. And you can see that they then pushed the efficiency up towards 3% of this approach. Um, but they didn't think that that was necessarily good enough and decided to include a transition metal oxide layer at the back of the device to include another shock barrier. In this case, in the, um, in the first case, this is pulling electrons into the, the front contact and pushing holes towards the back. And then the transition metal oxide contact layer pulls holes out at the back. And you can see that they were then able to push the efficiency up to 4.5%. And more recently, the device efficiencies in these systems have gone even a little higher than this. Um, but this is just an example of um, engineering the device architecture to um, tailor the energetics to maximize the amount of um, current abstraction um, 
due to as many photons as are incident on the device. And um, if you if you are interested in this technology and you attend Joey's talk, he, he has some very exciting results that they recently published on these uh, nanocrystal devices. And, but I, I won't steal his thumb out and tell you about that. Um, so the second strategy to minimize carrier recombination in this case is actually applicable to organic photovoltaics. Um, and Sean is going to give an introduction to LPD and, and give, you, give you a closer look at LPD mechanisms and concepts. But it basically um, pertains to the fact that organic materials generate, uh, the photo excitation of these materials generates an exciton. And so what that means is in a, in a bilayer device, for instance in here a poly 3 hexyl thiatine, that's a prototypical uh, conductor in polymer. And fullerene, if you have a bilayer, the issue is that to get complete absorption of the incoming light, your thickness has to be about 100 nanometers. So that's one over the absorption depth. And the issue is that in these materials, the exciton diffusion length, and that's the distance that an excitation will move prior to recombination, is only of the order of about 5 to 10 nanometers. So there's a big disconnect between uh, those length scales. And that means there's a compromise between efficient photon harvesting and complete exciton dissociation. So the initial strategy to overcome that is to mix uh, two materials, the donor and acceptor, into a blend to form a nanostructured, um, what they call a bulkhead junction. The reason for that is that um, the interface is through the bulk of the device, and that's hence the bulkhead junction. And so what that means is you have polymer and uh, fullerene domains. And in this case, you, you shorten the distance required for an excitation to reach the interface between the two materials. This solution um, allows us to exploit efficient uh, um, electron transfer from the polymer to the fullerene. But it has some practical difficulties. Um, the main one being that the actual nanomorphology that you form in these devices is left pretty much entirely to chance. There are some examples of um, processing strategies to, to optimize the nanomorphology, but it's not necessarily known beforehand what strategy will work best. And so that means that being able to control the domain size and keep it comparable to that exciton diffusion length and maintain percolation pathways for the carriers to the electrodes is actually a difficult thing to do. And the other thing is it's also pretty difficult to predict the electronic structure of, um, of these active layers because multiple phases exist. You have interfacial states that, you, that it's difficult to calculate because the precise molecular geometries of the interface are unknown. So a potential solution to that is to exploit long-range energy transfer. So the figure at the panel at the bottom shows an example of this where photon absorption generates an exciton, which is then able to transfer its energy all the way to the interface. So irrespective of the thickness of the film, that energy transfer is efficient enough to put your excitation at the interface and provide efficient carrier dissociation. Um, so the challenge is to develop materials uh, and or architectures capable of facilitating this long range energy transfer in the solid state. One example of that might be an energy relay array where you put a material that harvests the photons and efficiently transfers that energy to an interface where you can um, collect or um, create those charges and have, that, have these energy relay dyes dispersed in a matrix that simply facilitates charge transport after the, after the dissociation event. Um, one of the kind of um, motivating discoveries behind looking at energy transfer in these types of systems is that uh, coherent energy transfer was actually discovered in conjugated polymers even at room temperature. It originally wasn't thought that this was actually possible. Um, so in this case, the absorption occurs on a, on a certain conjugated segment of the polymer and energy can be transferred efficiently from one segment to another um, in this case, the authors illustrate the end product being fluorescence, but in a PV device, you want that to exit to reach an interface where you get free carriers. 
The problem is that these coherences, in this case, last for less than a picosecond. So the challenge is, can we design normal materials that prolong this coherence and actually allow us to use this mechanism to harvest the, the photons? Um, there have been a couple of recent experimental examples of using energy transfer in um, organic PV devices. The first one is um, what's called a disensitized solar cell. So in this case, you have um, a nanostructured titanium contact, which has these uh, dyes, sensitizing dyes absorbed on it. Um, and the typical disensitized solar cell consists of just this kind of architecture. But in this case, the authors actually put some energy transfer dyes into the electrolyte. And what they saw was that their energy transfer dye, in this case, this perylene derivative, um, which absorbs in the, the green and orange part of the spectrum and emits in the red and has good overlap with this false lining. So it would be expected that there'd be efficient energy transfer between these materials. And what they actually found is exactly what they wanted to, that they see an enhancement in the photocurrent when the perylene dye is present. And they attribute that to um, photon harvesting in the perylene and um, an increase in the number of carriers that are generated in that system. And then the second exa example actually comes from some initial work by Matt Lloyd and George Maliaris that then was uh, pursued in a little more detail um, by Gary and, and his group. Um, and that is a case where um, you have a solid state donor layer and an acceptor layer. And what they were actually looking at is um, how efficient transfer would be across an intermediate barrier layer between those two materials. Um, and their main finding was that uh, when you have copper thalassiamine as the donor material, and this is the copper thalassiamine absorption spectrum, as you start to introduce a thicker and thicker barrier layer, you see um, less and less contribution to the external quantum efficiency from that material. And that's an indication that the energy transfer across that barrier layer is actually um, very inefficient. But with P3HT, it was a different story. So in this case, the P3HT absorption is in this region of the spectrum. And what they found was, um, as they added a barrier layer, the contribution from P3HT remained up until um, several tens of nanometers thick barrier layer. And that's an indication that energy transfer across that barrier is actually very efficient. And this is a kind of lens scale that's much larger than um, would be expected necessarily in these solid state systems. And, and there has also been a, a fairly recent paper looking at um, blends of P3HT with a fullerene that's, that has suggested that um, there really isn't much exciton diffusion in the polymer, and that you get very efficient energy transfer from within a polymer domain directly to the interface, which is hanging along the lines of um, this um, deliberately engineered structure. Um, so that kind of covers. Um, uh, in the previous slide, what is the mechanism for the energy transfer from donor to exciton? Um, it's believed to be a threat, so it's a false resistance transfer. Um, it's kind of surprising uh, that, it, that that would actually be so efficient in, in these systems, mainly because the absorption spectrum of the fullerene is actually pretty weak out in the area where the, the polythiophene emission is. But still, um, with barrier layers of two to 20 or so nanometers, you still see a contribution from the P3HT. And I should have mentioned that the energy of this barrier layer, the bind up of that system is such that you wouldn't expect electron transfer through that barrier. You might get a little bit of tunneling at very small thicknesses, but at tens of nanometers, the only mechanism that, that should work on those line scales is energy transfer. So the role of this barrier is prevent the recombination? Um, that's actually, yeah, that's correct. I mean, that's one of the issues with the, the bilayer structure, apart from the fact that you have this disconnect between the thickness required for photon harvesting and um, efficient exciton dissociation. In this case, the barrier is mainly to, mainly there to prove that this mechanism actually even happens. 
this is very definitely not the ideal device architecture for these materials, but, the, but it's a good experimental architecture to show that you have energy transfer from these two materials. And then maybe that in the blend, this process is actually what's occurring, rather than just simple exciton diffusion to the interface. Can I ask another question uh -huh. about that? Idea which you said electronic coherence. What does it mean this coherence here? Um, in the case of the, the conjugated polymer, um, the, um, the kind of leading researcher in, in the system and the person who published that paper, Greg Scholes, um, when I talk to him, I, I get the impression that it means that the, um, the electronic energy is shared across a number of chromophores. Um, as time passes, that energy um, funnels downhill to basically the longest segment, and you end up with energy on a single chromophore. Um, they have performed calculations that suggest that initially it's shared that, um, across multiple chromophores that aren't even necessarily chemically linked. But, um, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, and to me it's a little counterintuitive. Um, but their experimental data um, suggests that these coherences uh, are definitely there. They're not particularly long lived, although much longer lived than you would expect in these systems under these conditions. Uh, sorry, quick question. What materials do they use for the barrier? Uh, the barrier in this case, I believe, is TPD, although um, we have used uh, a few other uh, wide band gap barrier mm -hmm. materials. So they're, they're small, wide band gap small molecules. Okay. okay, so for the remainder of the talk, um, the strategies for maximizing the performance of devices are all focused on the solar spectrum and how to utilize that as, as best we can. So, I'm just taking quickly an indication of the photon flux for the solar spectrum versus wavelength. Um, the integrated power density is one kilowatt per meter squared. Um, and so strategies to maximize photon harvesting can either be to modify the band gap, so push that band gap to lower energies and therefore be able to harvest more of the solar spectrum. Um, some more, uh, some newer strategies correspond to actually changing the solar spectrum, and we'll get into those a little later. And then finally, um, we can talk about changing the architecture of the materials are using specific device architectures to enhance the absorption cross-section of the material um, and that will maximize the amount of uh, the solar spectrum that can be harvested. And so uh, the first example is to um, change the band gap of the material and maximize the overlap of the, the solar spectrum. Um, this pertains mainly to low band gap like absorbers and OPD. And I'm pretty sure that Martin Heaney will cover some of this in his talks on LPD material synthesis. Um, so they as I mentioned, one of the prototypical conjugated polymers in LPD is poly-free hexylpiping. It has a band gap of around 1.9 EV, the PQ EQE greater than 75%, depending on how you process the device and what you use as your acceptor material. And it has been suggested that the internal quantum efficiencies in the systems are uh, approaching 100%. So for every photon that actually gets absorbed in the P3HD, you get a carrier, uh, you get an electron hole pad that can be collected at the, the electrode. But as you can see um, on this zoomed in scale on the solar spectrum, we're throwing away a lot of the spectrum here. Um, this is not just a problem for LPD. Um, amorphous silicon has a slightly smaller band gap and, and good EQE and IQEs, but again, there's a lot of the solar spectrum that's unutilized in amorphous silicon PV devices. And so for low band gap polymers, um, people have been looking at combining donor and accepting units. And the way um, we think about how that modifies the band gap is that the LUMO from the donor and acceptor components and are combined, they hybridize to give you two new um, unoccupied orbitals, and the same for the HOMO. Um, in this case, the, um, the actual HOMO of the donor acceptor polymer um, is dominated by the HOMO of the donor. 
and the blue mode, the donor accepted polymer is dominated by the accepted. Um, and what um, people are trying to do is um, change the bind gap of this polymer to shift the absorption threshold to lower energy, and therefore harvest more photons from the solar spectrum. But also, if you can move the actual homo and blue mode around, you can potentially create a larger offset with your acceptor and therefore increase the open circuit voltage in the device as well. So you have two opportunities to, to gain some benefit with this approach. You can increase the current density and the open circuit voltage and therefore get a kind of double hit on your increase in the, the power conversion efficiency. Um, and uh, I think, like I said, I think Martin will cover some of this hopefully in, in some of his talks and talk more about specific chemical structures that would actually um, give rise to low bank out polymers. One of the issues is that if you look at um, the portion of the solar spectrum avail available to P3HT, it's about uh, 10 to the 18 photons per second per meter squared. If you go to one of the prototypical low bang up polymers, you only really increase the number of photons available by about 25%. So reduction of the bang up doesn't always dramatically enhance photon offspring. And so that brings us to the next approach, which is based on these low bank up materials and that's tandem PV devices. Excuse me, may I ask a question for the three previous slides? Okay. Uh, in this case, since the LUMO and LUMO are married and we have a new band gap, uh, how can we control that further level? Because the, the only thing which is determining the open circuit voltage is the further level, but not the LUMO. Well, it's, it's to do with the quasi fermi level when you separate carriers across the interface. So the position of that LUMO relative, um, it's not the LUMO, it's the position of the HOMO, of the DOMA, so that in this case, the, the choice of terminology is not perfect. They call it a DOMA receptor polymerism, and you talk about a DOMA receptor blend. Um, so this DOMA receptor polymer becomes the DOMA in the DOMA receptor blend. And so it's the HOMO position of the polymer and LUMO position of the acceptor that determine the open circuit voltage. Okay, so in this case, we are not talking about the third level anymore. We are talking, we are considering this as a single molecular structure which has its own HOMO and LUMO and the excitation is from HOMO to LUMO. And, and, and but then you get carrier separation so you get electron injection from the LUMO of the donor acceptor polymer into your electron acceptor of the device. And if the open circuit voltage is determined by the quasi-fermi levels established as a result of placing carriers on either side of the interface. So if we have an interface, then we don't have a single new HOMO and LUMO. We still have separate HOMO and LUMO. That the figure on the left shows that these new homo and lumo are forming the new, uh, the new band. Yes, in, in the polymer, not in the not in the heterojunction. As as I mentioned, the, the terminology used for these polymers is is not um, is not ideal. Do not confuse these with donor and acceptor as in polymer and polymer. This is a donor acceptor polymer. It's, it's, a, it's a polymer that has electron rich and electron poor moieties in it, and that will result in a reduction in the band gap of that material. So it's like P3HT? It's, it's essentially <laughs> like P3HT, except you have electron rich and electron poor moieties within the polymer itself. And as a result of that, you reduce the band gap. And by tuning the positions of the hook that new homo, lumo, and the polymer with respect to your acceptor, you can then um, change the open circuit voltage of your device. Maybe the terminology push-pull is yeah. better for the polymer. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely right. Like push-pull or electron-rich, electron-pull. Um, donor acceptor has kind of become the generic term for this, even though it's exactly the same as the actual device terminology. It's definitely misleading or confusing. Okay, so um, Murray Tree from uh, TU Dresden will be giving a, a talk on tandem design. I know he's worked a lot in small molecule PV, um, but there's a good chance he'll touch on um, polymer-based tandems as well. 
Um, so in the case of a, a tandem device, what you're doing, and you heard a talk about tandems this morning, the, the approach is nominally the same for an OPD device. You're going to take one a material with one bag, bank out, um, in this case this polymer. I'm not even going to attempt to give you the, uh, the acronym for this. It probably contains lots of P's, D's, T's, and B's. Um, with another polymer that has a complementary absorption. So you can see where the dip in absorption for this polymer is. You have a maximum of the absorption of this polymer. And if you make two devices, you can see that um, you get these uh, two curves here. And if you can actually match the current generated in those <coughs> devices and create a tandem, then you get a device where you essentially sum the open circuit voltage. And the issue in this system is that uh, you have a number, um, you now have pretty much double the number of layers, so you have multiple processing issues, you have concerns with um, dissolving the underlying active layer when you deposit the top active layer, you have to generate um, a recombination junction between the cells, and you have to match the currents between the cells, which is not as straightforward as it seems. Um, that typically requires a lot of optical modeling to get the thicknesses right for all of the layers so that you can maximize, so, you, so that you can get the same amount of current in these devices. And so that's not straightforward. However, there are a number of examples. Andrew, can you go back a slide? <coughs> of your structure C, can you point out the donor and the acceptor of the in the background? Um, regards to the last question. This yes. is nice so, so I believe um, in this polymer, this is the acceptor, so the electron pole part of the polymer, and this is the electron rich unit. And in this case, um, these are the electron pole, that's the electron pole moiety, and this is the electron rich. So it's a push pull, so these are donating electrons towards this moiety in the middle. And uh, that new chemical structure gives you an entirely new set of um, occupied and unoccupied orbitals. Um, so there, here are three examples of polymer-based tandem devices. Um, I won't go into all the details, but this last example is now the record, um, at least at the time I put this talk together a couple of months ago, had the, the record efficiency for a tandem device certified. It probably doesn't have the record efficiency anymore. Um, and as I mentioned, Maurice will, will talk in more detail probably about these small molecule based tandem devices. Um, but in, in all cases, the, the approach is the same. You're looking to generate um, complementary absorption spectra in the two materials and then match the currents to try and give the best, uh, to give you just an enhancement in the open circuit voltage without losing any of um, the current you get from the individual devices. You can see that. They didn't do a very good job in this case, but um, they still get a pretty good device performance. Um, and actually, I believe uh, it may be these materials that now hold the, the record for the time and based devices. Um, at least um, it is sm small molecule time and that are up around 10% now. Um, and so the, the next strategy is um, to actually take the solar spectrum which contains a lot of photons and energies that we can't use and change those photon energies to ones where the devices work very well. And the first example of that is photon diamondization. This is also known as quantum cutting. You put one photon into a system and through a series of energy transfer steps you get um, two photons out. So this requires, um, in this case, lanthanide ion pairs. So um, you have absorption, in this case, up in the, the visible part of the spectrum, and then emission from the turbine. Um, the best examples have been from ultraviolet to visible down conversion. Um, these are limited in terms of uh, use down here because the solar spectrum that reaches the surface of the Earth doesn't contain many UV photons. Um, and so the only visible to infrared down conversion system uh, contains uh, these two lanthanide ions. And it has a quantum yield of about 140%, which sounds pretty good. 
But as of yet, there's been no proof of principle demonstration using a PV device. And so while um, both physical studies have suggested that this system works well, um, so far it, it hasn't actually uh, fall out in terms of actual PV applications. And the other problem is that a lot of these materials then um, are not applicable to some of the single junction PV devices. So for this particular lamp, iron couple, the only one of the only materials that would work would be crystal and silicon. Um, so the next strategy. In this case, we have quantum yields higher than 100%. So how is quantum yield that we find here that can have higher than 100%? It's, it's photons out for photons in. So if you can get two photons out for every photon you put in, your maximum theoretical quantum yield is 200%. So in this case, 140 means that for every seven photons, And so what, what this is, um, are lanthanide ions typically doped into an inorganic glass. Um, often it's an yttrium, uh, a sodium yttrium fluoride glass. And these are well-known host materials for lanthanide ions. They minimize the amount of quenching of the lanthanide excited state. Um, you have to have very fine control over the relative concentrations as well as the overall concentrations of these materials. Um, I, I believe the glasses are not necessarily difficult to make. Um, one of the issues with the lanthanide is the transitions are very narrow, so you only get a gain over a very narrow portion of the solar spectrum. What happens in the electronic structure that we can separate one electron hole separated into two electron holes? Um, you essentially uh, get an energy transfer, so this first transition um, matches the energy transfer for excitation of the terbium, and then you have a second relaxation that allows energy transfer in the second of the terbium line. And so it's just two sequential energy transfer steps. Um, there are it is proposed that there are some other mechanisms available in these systems. Um, I, I can, if you um, take a look at this paper, I think it goes into much more detail about what those mechanisms are. But it's essentially two energy transfer steps that give you um, take the energy from your sensitizing lanthanide ion and put it on the emitting lanthanide ion, which can then emit both of those ions can then emit with fairly high efficiency to photons. That can be then collected in the 3D device. Um, so the next uh, um, example is single fission, which is kind of nominally a, an analog of the process I just showed you. Um, there are going to be several talks on single fission, but there are actually two um, uh, talks that are specifically focused on single fission that will be given by Justin Johnson. Uh, this process is, uh, as I mentioned, also the molecular analog of multiple excitation generation in semiconductor nanocrystals. In this case, you have um, excitation um, of one molecule or chromophore into its first excited state. Um, that molecule can then relax to give you um, two chromophores in the triplet state. And so this requires the presence of two chromophores to be available. And so you generate an excited state that is shared between those two molecules, and they will, that relaxes down to give you two molecules in the triplet state. Um, it has been predicted that if you uh, take the same kind of shock quasar based um, curves for a single junction cell and you apply a single efficient cell um, in parallel with that, that you um, that you can boost the efficiency over and above the shock to all limits and get up to a maximum theoretical efficiency of about 45%. Um, the problem with this approach is that triplet states are, um, by nature, um, non-luminescent. 
Um, so any realistic solar for photo conversion mechanisms, mechanisms require direct injection of the carriers generated in the two triplet states into some kind of acceptor. So um, either a conducting oxide in a disensitized cell or a fullerene in an organic-based um, PV cell. And so in this case, the authors illustrate exactly this. You have um, a single fission system, which can eject two electrons into a titanium dioxide in, um, in parallel with a, 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 a single junction dye with a lower energy absorption. And so you get absorption at high energy in the single fission dye, lower energy in um, the single Vanguard dye, and injection of electrons into the oxide from both of those, and they have therefore a boost in the efficiency. Um, some of the challenges for singlet fission are that you have to consider the energetics. And that predominantly comes from um, the singlet triplet energy level splitting, but also the energy of any doubly excited state that you generate. And this is actually very much an active area of research right now. Um, for the process to be efficient, you need fission to be exergic from the relaxed S1 state. So the A the energy of S1 has to be higher than two times the energy of the triplet. Um, and uh, fusion, so the combination of these two materials back to give you a singlet has to be endologic. So um, the energy of um, S1 and any higher excited states have to be higher in energy than two times the energy of the triplet. That basically means that once you generate those triplets, they are now available to give you charge carriers rather than recombine to give you the signal back of some of that excited state that can then um, relax and, and uh, be of no need to. Um, as I mentioned, this process requires two chromophores and so there's an active area of research to look at coupling, chemically coupling chromophores that exhibit single fission to try and maximize the yield. Um, this means they must interact in some way um, and that brings forward the question, what is the mechanism for single fission? Um, is it either direct exciton formation, uh, this process here that takes you from a singlet on one chromophore and a ground state on the other to two triplets, or um, indirect through some, uh, either indirect through an intermolecular or intramolecular doubly excited state that takes you through a transition or maybe a charge transfer state or some other kind of doubly excited state. Um, two classes of uh, promising single fission materials are polyacenes. Um, these include tetracine and pentacene, although for tetracene uh, the energetics are not perfect. The energy of the uh, doubly excited triplet state actually lies a little bit higher than the lowest energy singlet state, and, and that means that you only get singlet fission either um, from a hot excited state or through thermal activation from the lower singlet state. But in the case of pentacene, um, that energetic um, issue is, is no longer there, and so you get fast and efficient um, triplet formation from, from any singlet state. Um, and another material that's, that recently showed um, a very high efficiency in uh, crystalline form is uh, diphenylisobenzofurane. Um, the interesting thing about this system is that when you make crystals of the material that form this uh, arrangement where the molecules are slick stacked with respect to each other, you actually get about a 200% quantum efficiency. So for every photon you put in, you get two, you get two triplet states. Um, efforts to try and couple these chromophores covalently have resulted in very poor triplet yields in the few percent. So clearly there's um, a, a lot of work to be done to try and uh, find the sweet spot of the interaction between these chromophores that will actually give you the maximum same efficiency. Um, with that said, there have been a number of examples of uh, devices where the authors have claimed to have observed same um, The most uh, convincing of these is data by Morfalo's group, where they generate pentacene C60 multiple samples and see an external quantum efficiency greater than 100%. Um, 
and there have been questions about whether they actually carried out their device uh, measurements correctly, but he has assured the community that those measurements were uh, performed very carefully and that this is actually real. Um, there's another example, I think this one's out of Mount Follows group, and then an example from uh, University of Cambridge. Um, but in these cases, it's not immediately clear from the data that singlet fission is actually occurring in these systems. Um, it is inferred because of the fact that the materials that they've used as um, the light harvesting materials, so tetracine in this case and pentacene in this case, both demonstrate singlet fission. Um, but there's no uh, conclusive evidence in the experimental data to show that single fission is actually occurring in the devices. Um, the next topic is um, kind of the inverse of the last two, and that is photonic conversion. Um, I'm actually giving a short talk on molecular photonic conversion um, for light hosting solar cells uh, later on in the summer school. Um, but I'll go over very briefly um, what this process is. And so as I mentioned, as I mentioned sorry, that's actually the inverse process of singlet fission. So you generate one excited state for every two photons. And that means that if you define the quantum efficiency as photons in to photons out and excited states out, the theoretical maximum is 50%. Um, and there's been a study by Nettie Kinsdorf's and Tim Schmidt that suggests that in a system that um, has perfect upconversion efficiency, you can actually enhance the performance of a single junction solar cell based on a wide band gaps uh, light harvesting material from um, around or below 30% up to around 40%. And the nice thing about this is there are systems that demonstrate fairly efficient photon of conversion um, in this region. Um, and and solar cell materials that have um, pretty good performance um, given their band gaps, that have band gaps in the right place. Um, and so this is a, essentially an anti stokes photoluminescence process, as I mentioned, the quantum loads are maximum is around 50%. Any kind of realistic solar flow conversion scheme um, requires optical coupling between the up conversion system. So, Play, you can place your up conversion system behind the device, bring in two infrared photons, convert those up to a visible photon which is re-emitted into the PD device and generate a current. Um, there have actually been a few proof of principle uh, measurements demonstrating that this process occurs and can be exploited in the PD devices, but you can also envisage um, using kind of a die-sensitized approach where you put your up conversion system onto another side of a die-sensitized cell and, and generate uh, free carriers directly from the up converted excited state. And so the, this process um, can either be carried out in lantern ion pairs similar to those used with photon dump conversion. Um, so in this case, you, ha you have um, the terbium, you have Generation of an excited state, and in this case, two of the terbium ions that allows you to transfer energy to erbium, up convert that erbium excited state to a, um, one of the higher excited states, and then see emission and you've got a brief of the part of the visible spectrum. Um, or in a molecular system, you, generally, you have a, uh, a sensitizer dye which harvests the infrared photons very efficiently. Um, those molecules are converted into the triplet state. They then transfer their energy to acceptor molecules. Two acceptor molecules come together and collide. One transfers its energy to the other. You're left with an acceptor in the excited state and another in the ground state. The one in the excited state can then emit its photon um, at higher energy. And this process requires long-lived, stable, intermediate excited states, and again, the principal measurements that show PD enhancement for both of these mechanisms. Um, in terms of photon gen uh, photocurrent generation from lanthan based systems, uh, these have been demonstrated for both amorphous silicon and for um, polythiophene-based organic photovoltaics. Um, 
some of the issues for lanthanide, this lanthanide based approach is that the absorption spectra are very narrow. So in this paper, the authors show um, absorption spectra that actually look fairly reasonable. But I challenge anyone to go away and measure a lanthanide ion with an absorption spectrum this broad. Um, another, another issue is that the transitions in these systems are power two forbidden. So the absorption is actually very weak. Uh, it's not an issue with the molecular systems, the absorption coefficients are very strong in those systems. And it's also, I, I write here, very difficult to tune the energies of the electronic transitions and really I should write impossible. Um, these transitions stem from f orbitals and lanthanide ions, which are very well shielded from their environment, and so basically nothing you can do to surround that lanthanide ion will change the energy of the transition. Um, the other issue is that the, um, this also gives a rise to strong overlap between the absorption and emission of these systems, and so there can be a lot of self-absorption and actually, there's a lot of um, self-quenching in these lanthanide systems. And then finally, specific to the erbium erbium uh, lanthanide ion pair, is you generate an erbium ion in, um, in a very high excited state, and you're looking for emission in the green and the red. But the strongest emission transition in erbium is at around 15, 30 nanometers. And so you have rapid relaxation down to that level. And therefore, you actually end up with a lot of photons and energy is lower than you even put into the system. And so it remains to be seen actually how efficient these systems can be made to be. In terms of the, the molecular of conversion systems, uh, the, the group of Tim Schmidt in, in Australia, the University of Sydney, have used this um, porphyrin macrocycle and rubri, actually two different derivatives of this placed on the back of an amorphous silicon solar cell in solution and show that the, um, the difference in external quantum efficiency for exciting, for having this uh, conversion system present and not, um, actually tracks the absorption spectra of the sensitizer dye. Um, you can see that the relative change is actually very small, only a few percent, but it is actually a demonstration that this is a viable process for the helium atom. Um, I should point out that this is in solution. Um, in terms of a viable approach to taking this to application, this is, this is simply not going to work. Um, a lot of the, the disensitized solar cell community are already trying to transition away from solution-based electrolytes um, because of the stability problems associated with those, and, and I can foresee the exact same issue with uh, solution-based conversion systems. And with that said, we, we attempted a similar um, experiment at, at NREL using uh, this platinum-based benzoporphyrin and this anthracene-based um, uh, acceptor material. Uh, we have a, had a cuvette placed in front, in this case, in front of a device, um, basically because we didn't have access to a transparent LPD device. Um, this again is in solution. This is our jerry-rigged experimental setup where we have a cuvette uh, with elastic bands attached to the filter. And you, can, uh, you can't really make out the device behind this filter, but if you look on the other side, this is our PD device. Um, in this case, the, the filter allows us to pass some of the emission from our acceptor molecule uh, through the device using excitation from a helium neon laser, and we measure um, with and without the acceptor material. So in the, in the case where we have no acceptor, just the porphyrin, there is no up conversion. Um, we still see some flood current, and we believe that to be due to direct excitation of the device. Um, but we see a small increase uh, when we have the acceptor present. Um, we can tell that we're not generating a lot of carriers in the device, for two reasons. One, the current density is in the tens of micrograms per centimeter squared range, and also our VOC is actually very low. But still, we see color current. And some of the issues with this approach, um, one is that um, chromophores tend to, can often aggregate, and so 
and we have a parallel derivative that we thought would be a good candidate when we measure the spectrum in solution. Um, we say nice, sharp features when that material is doped into a polyethylene glycol matrix. We see a strongly redshifted absorption, and that's due to interaction between the individual chromophores. And also, it should be noted that these are normalized, and the actual emission intensity in this case is much lower. Um, if we switch to something like rubrine, where the phenol rings on the tetracine core can actually twist out of the plane, that prevents the molecules coming close together and therefore keeps the electronic structure the same, whether it's in solution or the solid state, um, you actually see that the spectra are identical. Um, however, rubrine has its own issues and it, it is actually um, fairly unstable in um, ambient conditions. Um, there are two reasons for this. Oxygen can quench um, triplet excited states very efficiently uh, to produce singlet oxygen. Um, that in itself is a bad thing. It's taking away energy from the system that you're trying to use to upconvert and get higher energy photons. But also singlet oxygen can be extremely reactive and can therefore degrading materials. Um, and the other issue is that when you come along with a, a new acceptor material, um, that often means the energetics are different to your previous one, and so you need to tune your sensitizer to have appropriate energetics uh, to get efficient conversion. So chromophore combinations need to be developed at the same time. It's not often you can just go along and pick one off the shelf that will work with a new uh, sensitizer or acceptor. Um, and then, so that here is an example of sodium oxidation of rubric. In this case, um, as we do progressive number of scans, you can see the rubric emission decreases, and you see an increase in the emission from the pulverin, and that's an indication that the rubric is oxidizing and is being used up. And so this is in a polyurethane film with no encapsulation. If you put that same material in the polyurethane and encapsulate it, you see pretty much no degradation in the, um, in the photoluminescence. And so this is an indication that that is definitely oxygen that's getting into the system and uh, decreasing the efficiency. Um, if you then use rubrine and put it in polyethylene glycol, you can actually get away without encapsulate, and you see only a marginal decrease in the PL efficiency. Um, And then the, um, the final example is, in this case, is developing chromophore combinations. So in this case, we have a series of porphyrins where the energetics are tuned. And you can see as you tune the singlet energy, um, the red curves correspond to emission from the triplet excited state. And so by changing the uh, molecular structure of these systems, you're changing the energetics. And that means you need to choose the appropriate acceptor for the given um, sensitivity. Um, so finally, I'll discuss very briefly um, strategies for managing photons in PV devices. Uh, and there are a number of talks on plasmonic and photonic structures uh, that are used in PV throughout the summer school. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of some of those. The first is to, to use plasmonic materials. A plasmon is an electromagnetically attracted uh, the interface between a metal and dielectric. Um, uh, these, are, these require an extra jolt, uh, shown here on the, um, on the wave vector, on this wave vector plot. Um, and strategies for incorporating these into uh, PV devices include facing them towards the front of the device and taking advantage of forward scattering into the device, actually placing them into the active layer of the of the material to directly generate an enhancement in the field and therefore an enhancement in the absorption. And then also kind of a newer and uh, more complex process is to use plasmon waveguiding where you have a periodic structure that actually allows you to trap light within the active limb. And so in this case you're enhancing the field, in this case you basically enhance the path length of the light in the active limb. 
Um, there are sort of been several examples of this. One coming out of the Urban Water Labs group at, at NREL, where they have sold their nanocrystals into um, a PDOT-PSS layer and actually see um, that the transmission of the device decreases exactly where you would expect the plasma resonance for these solar nanoparticles to be. And that results in um, an increase in the short circuit current and correspondingly the efficiency of the device for a given thickness of the silver film. Um, another example of the same group is embedding silver nanoparticles directly into the Petri HD PCBM layer. And you can see here that the absorbance is in the active layer is enhanced. Um, but what you see is a decrease in the open circuit voltage factor and therefore efficiency. And so um, you actually enhance the absorption, but you run into the problem where the nanoparticles actually enhance recombination as well. And so you end up generating more carriers, but also increasing the recombination rate and therefore losing the amount that can be collected at the electrodes. And so a more recent approach um, to maximize the absorption coefficient or effective absorption cross-section is, um, is to think about a system like an OPD device where you generate a, an interfacial state where direct excitation can give you a carrier on one side of the interface, an electron on one side of the interface and a hole on the other. And this stage is potentially the same as one that is a result of um, excitation of the donor and energy an electron transfer across that interface. Um, it has been suggested that direct excitation into this CTX state, this charge transfer state, is quantitative, um, but the absorption coefficient is very weak. And so, um, Lin Lu's group out of Princeton showed that you can wrinkle a substrate that actually allows you to guide photons into the active layer and thereby increasing the path length in these materials by several orders of magnitude. And that means that um, absorption into that charge transfer state has to become effective. And so they showed an enhancement in device performance, an increase in the short circuit current, and also an increase in uh, this sub band gap absorption in P4HD-PCBM, which is believed to be due to the interfacial charge transfer state. Um, the, the interesting thing about this device is um, they actually have a thin gold layer which they use to act as the transparent contact and so obviously this is very much not an optimized device and so the challenge is to, um, to come across, to come up with a device architecture that is more realistic that will actually take advantage of this strategy to enhance the performance. So in conclusion I presented a, a number of strategies for enhancing PV devices by overcoming some of our loss processes. Um, I mentioned that some of these have been exploited very well and actually have led to significant advances in, in a uh, given technology, and others haven't even reached the proof of concept stage. So a number of scientific and engineering questions remain for even for those that have exhibited exhibit some promise. And then I'd like to acknowledge and all of these people for their input for the respective se sections. And finally, I mentioned that I am sponsored by the Department of Energy uh, Sunshot Initiative to work on molecular photon and conversion in photovoltaic devices. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Do we have any, any further questions? One thing you should actually remember, I'm going to disappear behind here a second. Talk, talk amongst yourselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so remember Kaz showed all those devices in his, in his opening presentation. One thing he said multiple times was that in order to really make these things success, successful, is we have to think about innovative ways of improving their efficiency. So you'll, this is the opening uh, presentation on that topic. As Andrew pointed out, you'll see this come up over and over again. 
uh, how to enhance the basic efficiency of solar cells. Uh, even though we can buy a silicon solar cell now at 20%, it's not enough. So, do we have any, any questions before we have a break? Yes, Andrew, you can answer your own questions. Take them Towards the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, having the global layer very thick, it uh, leads to uh, a lot of recognition between uh, the electrons and holes. So my question is, why not just use like uh, uh, one-dimensional uh, nanostructures like uh, nanotubes, so that to have the, uh, the absorption uh, in a very long uh, direction and just the charge separation uh, along the, the diameter of the tube? to decrease the, this charge recombination? Um, there are definitely uh, people who are trying to exploit this kind of thing, um, trying to generate nanostructured specific, uh, nanostructured devices with a specific structure to exploit exactly these kind of things that you're, you're suggesting. Um, being able to tailor a nanotube Film so that you have all of your nanotubes pointing in one direction is a challenge in itself before you even think about um, putting that into place. Um, the, the other issue is that the, um, if, for instance, if you orient a nanotube in that direction, you may actually be orienting it so that the transition dipole for its absorption points in the wrong direction for a photon coming into the film. So you essentially make the film transparent to, the, to an incoming photon. So you have to think about some of these things, but there are definitely people who are, are looking to do exactly that with carbon nanotubes or um, oxide, oxide-based nanotubes or nanopellars um, to try and take advantage of um, specific uh, physical properties and also the length scales that um, over which an excitation or a carrier can move. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the uh, upconversion OPV devices. So the concept is, right, OPV only absorbs and is limited in its absorption to its band gap. So you basically use some um, material that gives you anti stokes photoluminescence, so it absorbs in the infrared and is that essentially is able to pump the OPV optically so you can get the photons that you can't normally harvest. Yes. So then what materials are people trying to use for that uh, anti-stokes photoluminescence layer? Like what materials have people tried? So the, um, the main examples for the sensitizer materials are porphyrins and thalassanes. These are typically fairly um, common and easy to get hold of. You said thalocyanides, like uh, thalocyanides. CPC, TPC? Um, these are mainly uh, platinum or palladium based materials. Um, the emitted materials are often highly luminescent um, polycyclic aromatics, um, so um, anthracene, tetracene based materials or perylene based materials. Um, oh. Then people are looking at how you actually incorporate these into the devices, and so yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, sorry. When I saw that, I, I thought to myself that basically this uh, up conversion antisolus photoluminescent lessons layer is kind of like a color filter in a way, but it's giving it's pumping you another photon. So it would be, it doesn't need to necessarily be incorporated into the organic PV stack. It can be outside the yeah, substrate. That's exactly the strategy that most people are, are looking to, to take advantage of. And so that allows you to make a device that works just fine, mm -hmm. but transmits light in the infrared, and you have an upconversion system that you don't have to worry about disrupting the electrical performance of the device. You can place it on the back of the device and try and get as many of those upconverted photons back into the mm. UPV device. I'm sorry, how much of an enhancement did you see in the devices you guys dropped? <laughs> um, well, it, it was a pretty small enhancement on top of the critical performance. I, I mean, relative enhancement, maybe 50% of the current, but it's 50% of the of, of the Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll take this the last question because I noticed that you know, Chuck Butch is sitting in the back not paying attention. <laughs> so he's going to start at quarter past four, I think. 
lost it on. And so, if you if you would mind the last question. Yeah. Uh, yes. I have a general question about the synaxia because uh, you were talking about two triplet excited state, but if you see the binding energy of singlet and triplet, triplet has a higher binding energy than singlet. So how do you argue singlet to you? Um, what happens do you have for a triplet having a higher binding energy? It is generally assumed that because um, if you see the vacuum moment, singlet is here, triplet is here, the binding energy of singlet is lower than that of it, It's further from vacuum. I would actually insinuate that a, that a triplet exciton potentially has a smaller binding energy than singlet. Well, look at me. It is generally assumed that triplet has a higher binding energy. It has a it has like higher energy compared to the vacuum level. That's not the same as the binding energy. The binding energy is the energy required to move those carriers off to infinity. That's not the same as moving it to the vacuum level. I mean, I, that's an important distinction because then, even if you look at just a single in LPV, you would say it has a binding energy of several EV, and it doesn't. It has a binding energy of a few hundred MeV. So that's an important distinction. From a physics standpoint, the triplet is lower energy than Yeah, but in terms of the binding energy, it, it is at a lower energy, but the binding energy is at a higher point than that. We can lower it, yes. We can talk about that. Yeah. I think you're making reference to the electron affinity of the triplet state is higher, yeah. or the finalization of the um, electron affinity. Yeah. We we're tidying this up. Yeah, so that you can tell everyone what the answer is later on. We'll bring you out here. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> no pressure. I'll teach, you, I'll teach you to ask tough questions. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a 10 minute break now uh, and let Chuck Butcher. Let's thank Andrew once again.